In this section, talking about conference life, we're going to talk about how we are organized and what happens um, within a conference. I just have to say, if I had to pick two sections that I would like to present, it would be the, the introduction that I did earlier about, because I get to talk about the three essential elements, and then it would be conference live, so I get to talk about conferences, the two things I like to talk about most. And as it happened, those were the two where the need was, so I got to, to present these two. So I am grateful for this opportunity. All right. So um, this is a quote from St. Vincent de Paul. The poor suffer less from a lack of generosity than from a lack of organization. So think back to what Cheryl talked about um, today, about how the St. Vincent saw the need for the, the ladies who were taking care of the family, going you know, one a day to, um, to organize their efforts. So as we've seen, he was a great organizer, and he believed um, a reasonable level of organization is actually critical to helping the poor. So our neighbors in, um, in need are the reason that our whole society exists, as you can see by our organization uh, chart. It looks kind of upside down. We kind of refer to it as the upside down org chart when we're talking about it, because you would expect, at least I would have expected, to see the International Confederation of St. Vincent de Paul at the top of the org chart, but it's not. The, the, the people living in poverty, our neighbors, as we serve, they're at the very top of, of the chart and just supports that they are the reason that our society even exists. So the conference is in the center of our lives as Vincentians, and which is one of the reasons I'm sure that brought you here today. And then all the layers below conferences, they exist solely to support the work of the conferences, and they are no bigger than they need to be. So what is a conference? It's uh, the basic unit of the society, and it's usually parish-based. We have a couple in Dayton that aren't parish-based. We have, um, well, a few now, because CJ will join us as a conference soon. And then we have the University of Dayton. They have a, a conference, and they're actually quite active um, this semester. We're real excited about that. And also, we have Our Lady Mother of Refugees. They are mission-based, serving the, the uh, refugees in the community and not defined to a geographic area. So the conferences are usually small groups, um, between eight and 15. If you get too large, then you may lose a little bit of the essential element of friendship, right? Because we want to come and meet together as friends and, and get to know, one, um, to know one another. Conferences meet at least twice a month, so there's time for spiritual growth. And it's led by a president who is elected by the, the members and can serve a two year consecutive, two consecutive terms, two three year terms. So a president can serve for six years. And then after that, it's time to bring a new president on board. And um, conferences also have a spiritual advisor. And this was touched upon in the um, spiritual, spirituality section. So he or she is present at every meeting and to ensure that every meeting has both prayers and a spiritual reflection. And it helps the, the conference to keep their focus on the spirituality, which keep in mind that that is our primary purpose of this society is growth and spirituality. Shannon, you said you're um, the spiritual advisor at St. Luke. So if anybody, you wanna raise your hand if anybody would like to know a little bit more about that, um, Shannon is here and was, will share um, how she does, what she does and prepares for meetings. So each conference decides how they're going to do the home visits based on their area and the needs of their neighbors and which other charities, works of charities that they need to, um, to undertake um, based on what they see in their home visits. As Zeke and John told us, um, that's done at the, um, the, the local level. And, the, and we are divided and organized geographically, so we know and we can identify the needs and also the resources that are available in the areas and the neighborhoods that we serve. So conferences are free to do any type of charity that they see a need, and this allows Vincentians 
um, to respond to unusual needs that, that they may have, such as maybe somebody needs help in getting a driver's license reinstated, and there may be some, some uh, fees that are standing in the way of making that happen. Or maybe somebody needs a wheelchair. Every now and then we have seniors reach out because they are going to have a surgery, and when they come home, they need um, like a recliner to sleep in, or they need a, a bed because they may be sleeping on a near mattress or even on the floor in some instances. So some of these more unusual needs the conferences can respond to. The, the Urban Outreach Center recently purchased a, um, a laptop for a family. Um, their, the, the, uh, their adult child is dying and they're caring for their adult child in the home, the, the mom and the dad, and she had to leave her job. She had, a, she had a good job and she had to leave it to help care for her son. So we, but they needed a, a better laptop so that she could do some remote work. So we purchased her a laptop. Um, and also food and transportation and, and on and on, as you all know from your discussions and your conferences. So financial resources, they're developed um, uh, with the pastor and the parishioners, and there are different, and these are different in different parishes, as, as you know, may know. Some of them, the conferences and the parishes have a poor box. Um, you may be familiar with the fifth Sunday collection, the envelope collection on the fifth Sundays. Some of them just have regular St. Vincent de Paul collection envelopes available. Some of them may do a percentage of the Sunday offering. Maybe some special sun fundraisers by the parishioners. Uh, maybe some grants, but these are all examples of how the conferences and um, get their financial resources. Okay. So here is a sample agenda. And this sample agenda is actually found in our manual, that, which you have in front of you. Um, I used to know the page number, and I'm not recalling it exactly right now. But um, this is, gives you an, an idea of, how, of what a meeting should look like. And this is a standard agenda in the United States, St. Vincent de Paul. So it's kind of tried and true. We know this one works well. But I would like you to look at it for a minute. And do you see the three essential elements in the meeting agenda? Opening prayer. Prayer. Opening prayer, so there's our spirituality. Another one, we've, we've uh, talked about spirituality. Do we see friendship? Home visits could be um, friendship, we're coming together in service, but also we're actually going to the meeting, right? So this is the meeting agenda, we're at the meeting, so we're coming together as friends. And then how about service? Home visit yeah, home visit reports, committee reports, those kind of things, maybe, um, and maybe order new business, all right. So again, we wanna see the essential elements at all levels of the society. All right, so we're gonna talk for a while about uh, effective conferences over the next several slides. So we have some suggestions that we're gonna discuss about what makes a conference effective. And you can find all of this uh, material in more detail as jo Deacon John just ref referenced in the Serving for Hope, I think it's um, volume six. But let's talk about a few things here. So the effective conference thinks of the poor as Jesus himself. And this means messages are checked on our phone lines, our helplines regularly, and visits, home visits are made promptly. And the conference is easy to find and easy to get a hold of. And we, re we respond to those who are seeking help. The effective conference, as we've talked about, meets regularly, and that normally that's two times a month. We do have one of our conferences that actually meets every two weeks. And a successful conference has a genuine commitment to, the, um, to spiritual purposes and to Christian friendship. Conference prayers and reflections are never omitted and people are thoughtful of each other. So sometimes, and especially when we get into the holidays and some of the conferences may be doing like a um, Thanksgiving program or a Christmas program, and you might get to a meeting and wanna cut the opening gospel reflection and discussion a little short because you wanna to get to the business at hand. 
but we have to remember to you know keep a balance of those three essential elements and keep in mind that our primary purpose is the um, growth in spirituality so we don't want to cut that um, spirituality part out or cut it back to make room for the business so um, conference also they do some recruiting and they see new members as a blessing and as a district, we're working to put some more recruitment tools in the hands of the conferences um, to, to help keep them vitalized. So Deacon John touched upon some of us, this, but there are a few rituals that the spiritual advisors may use. And then a couple of the resources are the spiritual advisor handbook, and then also something called Vincentian celebrations. And if you don't have that, again, I'd love to make sure that all of you have that. It's available for purchase on the website, but I also think it's downloadable. And I can, again, take a look if anybody is interested. Uh, it has all kinds of um, commissioning activities and all the language that you would need. So some of the few rituals that you would want to consider with your conference in an effective conference is you'd want your spiritual advisors to consider arranging for commissioning of new members, have like a short commissioning ceremony, um, and also a leadership pinning when you are taking on new um, leadership. And then some other things that you might want to do together are attend uh, the Eucharist together, uh, maybe celebrate our annual renewal of membership together at Mass. It's a very short um, ceremony. Maybe conferences want to attend a special feast day mass or celebration together. The district has two prayer services a year, and um, but on the feast of St. Vincent de Paul in September, we had a prayer service. But interestingly, that day, the, um, the UD folks, the University of Dayton Conference, um, I met with them over at noon, and we attended mass together. That's how they chose to celebrate the feast day. You can read about all of these more fully in the manual that you have in front of you. Um, the rituals for all of these services are included, as I said, in that Vincentian celebration book. And I just want to say, and I'll probably just say a few more times today, our National St. Vincent de Paul website, it has so many resources. Uh, and <laughs> I think it's ssvfusa.org, um, but I can help you find that. And I. I sometimes have a little problem navigating that website, but I'd be happy to give you a quick tutorial in how to find those resources that you may be interested in. Okay, so as a conference, a question to consider when thinking about new members, are we offering everyone a chance to be of incension, or are we just offering it to those more senior, those more retired people, or whoever kind of looks like us, seems like us. One aspect of recruiting, which we often don't take a look at, is you know who are we inviting? And another thing, how easy is it to join? I'm just going to step aside for a minute and, and go off the script for a second and say, if your conference does not have a new member process in place, how, what happens when you would take on a new member, make sure you have that in place before you bring on new members because you want to have something in place and you want to make sure that right away you're giving them the opportunity to serve um, in the manner in which you know they, they wish to serve. So they were called to the conference for a reason, looking at our three essential elements. It may be any one of those three essential elements, right? That somebody feels called to the society. Oftentimes it's service, but it may be that somebody is really focused on the spirituality, or maybe somebody is seeking that friendship opportunity um, through the conference. So it could be any one of those three. But whatever is calling that person, you want to make sure you know them and make sure you give them an opportunity to fulfill that calling in your conference. So you want to have that in place before you start taking on uh, new members. So looking at our conference body then, does it represent that of our parish? And often we have only a section of the parish that may be represented, as I just mentioned. 
Um, but the main purpose as a society, remember, is to grow in holiness. And, and we do that by coming together as friends in service to those in need, as we've said now several times. Again, our essential elements. But we want to make that opportunity available to everyone and not just those who, as I said, might be more senior or might look like us. We want to look for ways to, um, to make our conferences and our district uh, more, and our society generally more diverse. So new members, they're going to bring you know, different backgrounds. They're going to bring different experiences. So, and just looking at our, our CJ um, people that are here with us today, they're going to bring a particular talent because of their youth. They're in interested in social justice. So they might bring that, you know, cause a conference to consider some type of special work um, related to social justice that maybe the rest of us hadn't thought about. So it's bringing those new ideas and those, the, the zeal and the energy um, for other works, other ways to serve our, um, our neighbors. And we're also, when we look at um, recruiting, we want to think about future leadership. It's not always about having enough members to do the work, and I would encourage you to not use that as a reason to, um, to recruit new members, but look at it more as an opportunity, and a, an opportunity to grow in spirituality and engage in those three essential elements. How are we doing on time here? Okay, so we're going to take just a, just a couple of minutes, and as a table, I'd like you to um, pick. Craig, could your table take the first bullet, and then uh, the large table here take the middle one, and then the rest of you can take the third bullet. So I would like you just talk to, just talk among yourselves for a moment, each of those topics. Well, whichever one you were assigned. How could you include the following people within the works of your conference? How could you reach out to them? One, through the first bullet, both people who work during the day and people who can't drive at night. How could they be included in the work of your conference? And the second one, what about families and, and our younger people? And then third, people who talk with God in a language other than English. What do we do? So just take that discussion um, just for a few minutes and how could you include those groups within the works of your conference and what strengths might they bring to your conference? Two minutes. Okay, and speaking of memberships and members, we do have two different uh, levels of members and we say, uh, I'm sorry, we have two different types. They're not levels. One is not better than the other one. They're just different types of of membership. So we have an active membership and then what we call an associate. So active members, to be an active member within the conference, then um, active members are Catholic and they regularly attend meetings and they participate in the works of the conference. And these are the only members who can vote, after all, because you want people voting and making, um, contributing to the decision making, those who are attended meetings and staying um, up with the current discussions of the conference. So the associate members, those are um, also, they uh, uh, participate in the conference works. They can fully engage in the works of the conference. They may or may not attend conference meetings and you don't have to be Catholic to be an associate member. As we said, we invite and welcome everyone. Okay, so we're gonna go back and cover just a few more things about what makes um, uh, or guidelines for a successful conference. And the, the um, effective conference is also going to work with other organizations. So we don't fund in any way other organizations. Sometimes we'll have a conference ask, you know, we, can we uh, give some money? We have a little extra money. Can we give it to the, um, the, the small shelter that we have in our community? And the answer is no. Um, the money that was donated to St. Vincent de Paul was donated for St. Vincent de Paul to, distri to distribute. So no, we don't give out um, money to or fund other organizations. We can help with in-kind goods, maybe blankets or beds, that kind of thing. Um, but we do want to participate in shared projects with other organizations within our community. 
So conferences uh, may want to partner or work, work closely with a community food pantry, for instance. If the conference doesn't have their own pantry, then they'll have a working relationship with a pantry or another organization. And uh, the council is uh, where you work with also with your neighboring conferences. And, neighboring conferences. We do that through the work of the council, and uh, Matt is going to talk to more about the um, council and what goes on at the council level um, in the next section. And then finally, um, effective conferences, they give out money as it comes in. So conferences, they don't hoard money, and they're not saving it for a rainy day. You know, for the poor, it's, it's an always a rainy day, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to put some money back and not serve somebody now um, because we may want to serve somebody in the future. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. God gives us the money um, to be good stewards with those financial resources, and then we give it out as best we can through our conferences and through those consensus decisions that we make through the workings of our conferences. And conferences that run low on funds almost always, and Probably almost every Vincentian in here can tell this, can tell a similar story where our, the treasury goes down and down and down, and it's going to be a while before the next donation comes in, and everybody starts to panic. But then, amazingly, the conference is blessed with some type of um, large donation of some sort, and it carries them over. And I see Craig nodding his head, and Jean was nodding her head, and Rachel's nodding her head. That is just the experience of the conference. So you just want to you want to trust in God's providence to make sure that the conference has the resources that that we need. Um, I will say that the rule does permit conferences to keep a quarter's worth of um, what you would normally spend in a quarter. It's okay to keep that back. Okay, so um, a successful conference is accountable. <laughs> I'm probably going to see some eyes roll when we think about reporting because it's time for the fourth qu quarter fiscal year report and also our annual reports are due just around the corner. But we are expected to be accountable and we're expected to be responsible with our resources. So, of course, donors expect us to be good stewards of the money that they're giving to our conferences. And um, so do our, our parish and our diocese and the, Saint, the, um, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. I mean, we use their names. So if we do something um, uh, bad or may end up with some bad press, that's going to reflect not only on our conference, but maybe on the, the broader um, community. So we want to make sure that we are accountable and doing those things that we need to, to do with our reporting. I'm not going to talk about the 990s that's on here, but the, for the Dayton District Council, that's taken care of at the council level. Um, but I do want to talk about some, a few other things here. We all have conference bylaws, and all of the conferences in the Dayton District Council, I will tell you, are current in the, um, the most current um, national St. Vincent de Paul bylaws. So that's all done for everybody. But um, they describe how the conference operates. And um, bylaws follow, as I said, they follow this um, set pattern um, as specified by the National St. Vincent de Paul to make sure that everybody's consistent and um, legal, <laughs> doing things the way that they should be done. Conferences, we want to make sure you have insurance. In the Dayton District Council, we have an insurance policy um, that covers Vincentians as long as they're doing the work at the conference and you're, you're working within the, your Vincentian vocation. And you also want to make sure that you have a checking account that's separated and designated specific to your conference. Um, as, as specified in the, in the manual. Must be St. Vincent de Paul only checking account. It can't be mingled with um, the, the funds of the parish or any particular member, like the treasurer can't run it through his own checking account, that kind of thing. And uh, the books, we want to have them reviewed at least, or I'm sorry, by an independent third party annually. So the conferences in the Dayton District Council we might want to, and this, is, this has been a recent conversation, as we look at that annual audit. 
So some of the conferences are talking about pairing up, maybe within your parish family or just maybe a neighboring conference. And maybe the treasurer of one conference might look over the books of another conference and then that treasurer will yeah. um, look. And doing self-audits. Yeah, and doing the self-audits, yeah. Okay. Okay, any questions then about accountability before I move off of this slide? Because I kind of flew, flew through that one and it's, okay. Sometimes we get some questions on that. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about confidentiality. Obviously, confidentiality is important to us in our Vincentian vocations because it's important um, in building trusting relationships with those we serve. We, um, we, don't, we can disclosures to a member or conference and we're not gonna reveal it to anybody else um, without the consent of that individual. Now, we often at times will have to call a landlord or call the utility company to, in order to make, to help somebody with a particular assistance that they um, request. And um, I always, I think it's a good practice to always just say, is it okay if I call the landlord? Is it okay if I call the utility company on your behalf? Obviously, if you're going to pay the landlord, you assume that you know you're you know you would assume that the neighbor would know that you're going to have to call the landlord or you're going to have to call the utility company to make that payment. Although I really encourage you just to go ahead and make that simple statement um, to help with your rent. You understand we're going to have to call your landlord. Do I have your permission to do so? And then same with the ut utility couple. You understand that I'm going to have to call and check on your account. Do I have your permission to do so? Um, I. I don't know when I started doing that or, or why, but I always do it. And I'm glad I did because a few weeks ago, I found myself um, in a somewhat sticky situation. We were helping with the rent application. And um, when I called the utility, I, I said, you know, I'm gonna call, and I was with her. I'm, I have to call the utility company. Do I have your permission to do so? And she said, yes. And then the utility company shared some very uncomfortable information. And then I had to, to share it with the um, neighbor and then she was really upset. But fortunately, I, you know, I reminded her, well, I did ask if it was okay if I call the utility company. So um, you can learn from my experience and just remember when calling a landlord or utility company, just to go ahead and ask first. Now, in the event you're dealing with something unusual and you want something more formal, there is a um, release of information on the national website that you could actually have that, get that in writing. We also kind of want to be careful with avoiding accidental sharing. So if somebody else uses your com computer, for example, and you're in a home and several people are, are sharing the same computer, then um, and you're doing Vincentian work or discussing a neighbor by email, you want to make, you know, kind of put some safety um, measures in place to keep that from happening so that we're not sharing with everybody in our household. And just one final thing, um, I want you to, there at the back of your participant, participant guide, there is a section, just, I think it's a single page that talks about reporting suspected abuse. And I will tell you right now that the Dayton District Council is currently in the process of, of putting a more for, formalized safeguarding policy and um, procedures in place. But for the short term, until that is in place, you can uh, look over that as your time permits. Okay, well, this is a good question. How do we do all of this? <laughs> So we're talking about all kinds of things. We put a manual in front of you and all kinds of rules in front of you. How do we do all this? Um, well, the rule, I will tell you, it captures the spirit and the philosophy of the society, but also the structure and, and how to make it work as we would expect um, because we know that um, St. Vincent de Paul was such an organizer. So we have that rule and the manual in place to help us with all of this. So the, the, um, the rule, the international rule, it grows with the society. Obviously, if we think back to the, the times and think through the history, that section that Cheryl covered with us today, the society looks a lot different now in terms of the needs and assistance and, and how we function than it would have looked you know, 250, 175 years ago, right? 
So, but the rule is going to continue to grow and keep pace um, and to meet the changing needs. And changes are a serious matter, and they're they're only made after after much thought. And if you look at this timeline, you can see some some of our changes. But of significance, of significance, if you look at 1968, um, re based on Vatican II, we see that women were admitted to the Society of Saint Vincent de Paul. Okay, and if you want to pick up your rule, you, everyone has one, and if you want to take a, take a look at it, you'll see that the rule is uh, divided into three parts. Part one talks about the philosophy and principles of the, uh, of the organization, its basic structure of the society. I'm going to take a, take a, just look at one particular rule or two, and you can kind of read and see the content that's covered in part one. And if you go on and take a look at part two, that talks about the structure of the International Society. Please do not give me a quiz on that section. <laughs> and then if you take a look at part three, those are useful rules that are particular to the United States. As I say, I'm, I'm never in part two of the rule, but I live in one and three, and I think that's what you'll find um, in, in your conference work. So you want to become familiar with the rule. Obviously, many ways that you can do that. One way is to read a, a section of the rule at each conference meetings, and I know some conferences do that. As you'll see, and here's an example, and you just looked in part one to see what, is, what the rule looks like. You can see they're very small sections, maybe a paragraph or two. So that's something that can easily be incorporated and added to the agenda in a conference meeting. But in the Dayton District Council, if you're receiving the weekly conference notes, you will see that we are walking through the rule in a year. So we started January 1st, it's divided and um, chunked out so that by the end of December, we will have walked through the rule. And so that's another way to do it. We will start again in January of 2024 and continue to walk through the rule again. Okay, so um, another way to help, I want you to pick up your manual now, if you will, and take a look at the table of contents. Hey, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. You may notice that over half of the manual addresses the spirituality of the society. The business portion is actually fewer pages than the, than the text that addresses um, the necessity and the importance of Vincentian spirituality. And I also mentioned the national website, and let me just mention it again, it's a tremendous wealth of resources. And in addition, we also have district council um, support. So uh, as a staff to support the conferences, you have me, you have Rita Long, who's our conference specialist, and we're available every day, most days, to answer your questions that you may have. You also have the support of your fellow Vincentians in your conferences. You have the support of the um, Board of Trustees, a board which is comprised of our conference presidents and um, Michael and Matt and everyone else. So you have all kinds of people support around you. Okay, let's look at the clock. We are right on time. And that concludes the conference um, section and we're gonna turn it over to Matt and he's gonna talk about 
um, council life, and then we'll have lunch. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So Deb's